my friend and colleague, uh, Peggy Lee, um, uh, you are, are their hero. And so I've been charged with uh, having some of Peggy's questions uh, okay. uh, asked oh. on her behalf. Um, so I, I have the privilege of working with Peggy over at the Internet Archive over in San Francisco. Sure. And so uh, I was forwarded on one of the email threads where I learned a little bit about the fact that you have a domain archive.tw. And I would like to dedicate it to archive.org use if, awesome. if we figure out something. Yeah. Um, so, so rather than being prescriptive in any way, I'm really excited okay. just to spend this time learning. Sure. Um, especially about uh, what you see as being the future of archival in, mm -hmm. in Taiwan across many forms of multimedia, such as books, websites, mm -hmm. uh, other important cultural um, artifacts for, for Taiwan. Uh, and so to, to try to be as respectful as possible of your time, uh, I thought I would break my questions into to three sections. Sure. And feel free to navigate as, as, uh, as you see interested. So the, the first section, really to do justice to some of Peggy's questions, is around archival uh, possibilities for, for partnership. And as the Internet Archive is a nonprofit, um, kind of our, our mission, I'm going to speak for myself, not for the Internet Archive in this case, but uh, my, my personal story is mm -hmm. I ended up at the Internet Archive because uh, Aaron Swartz was a, a friend and, and mentor of mine. And his passing left a, a pretty large gap. Mm -hmm. uh, OpenLibrary.org was one of the services he started, and that's the, the program I'm kind of directing at the Internet Archive now. So I have a special place in my heart both for, mm -hmm. for Aaron and for books. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just the other day during the office hour, I mentioned that I translated the uh, Guerrilla Access Manifesto uh, to Mandarin uh, Chinese, and, and that's how I learned uh, about Aaron's work. Uh, wow, yeah. mm -hmm. that's amazing. Uh -huh. um, so, one of the things that, that uh, the Internet Archive does is it's almost like a public Dropbox. And the intention is for it to be used for like, legitimate cultural heritage and preservation. Mm -hmm. But something that I know that Brewster, the, the founder of the Internet Archive, is really passionate about is providing unlimited free storage to good causes. Mm -hmm. And a lot, of, a lot of groups don't believe him. Like there was one group called eTree, which had uh, audio files from all of these live music concerts uh, around the world. And they were trying to serve them from, from like academic mm -hmm. uh, college servers and running out of space and it was, it was musical chairs. And so he said, how, how would you like free storage forever? And they were like, we don't believe you. Mm -hmm. And now there's 2 million live music tracks from around the world, um, a lot of happy bands and, and patrons from around the world. So my first question, is, is specifically, is there an opportunity for the, the Internet Archive to play a role in backing up Taiwan's cultural heritage mm -hmm. or, or even having a more, um, more ambitious outcome of doing web crawls with Taiwan or, or just even, even if there's no formal arrangement, just being free storage to help mm -hmm. Taiwan in its mm -hmm. mission? Yeah, uh, the Ministry of Culture specifically calls uh, the digital public infrastructure, well, public infrastructure, uh, which is uh, not as easy as it sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, like five years ago, when I first became digital minister, I worked with the then Ministry of Culture, Zheng Li Jun, uh, to uh, work with the National Accounting Office to convince them, like, Things made of non-concrete material can also be public infrastructure, uh, and and uh, we succeeded. Uh, and so, because of that, uh, the Ministry of Culture has been funding, uh, for example, the um, Taiwan uh, Digital Model Library, uh, which is the heritage historic sites and so on, using drones and photogrammetry to capture very high resolution, uh, like polygons uh, mm -hmm. or dot clouds, so that anyone can use it for any cultural or game or whatever work. Um, and that's one. There's also memory.culture.tw, the National mm -hmm. Memory Archive. That's Lucian's. Yeah, that's Lucian. Uh, Lucian is part of the, the work there. Uh, it, they provide high quality, uh, just personal memory. I also uploaded some uh, old photos um, there uh, as a permanent uh, storage for Creative Commons licensed or public domain uh, works uh, that are uh, culturally significant to the person. <laughs> uh, and, and people could uh, then curate it into a uh, new, uh, like traveling down the memory lane and things like mm -hmm. that. So, um, and there's many others. If you get in, in, in touch with Lucian, I think he has a very good uh, grasp of what 
what are the uh, I think he's also involved with the National Palace Museum digital preservation um, efforts uh, and the Academia Sinica of course runs the digital archive Shui Dian Cao for for decades now so uh, there's there's many publicly funded project uh, but recently we've uh, rebuilt it as public infrastructure, uh, which is the, the new thing, yeah. Wonderful. So, so just to, to see if I, I understand correctly, sure. it seems like there's there's at least three different projects. That's right. One is really a community centered around preserving kind of the individual memory lands. That's right. And that's memory.culture.tw. That's right. Uh, the second one is the Ministry of Culture uh-huh. has an effort um, mm-hmm. to, uh, to to more digitize public infrastructure right. using drones mm-hmm. and, and other equipment. Right, right. So like historic buildings and things like that. Uh, and both memory.culture, the TW, and the Taiwan Digital Assets Library are funded by the Ministry of Culture. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the, the final uh, piece that you mentioned mm-hmm. is, is... The National Palace Museum, National which Palace is its Museum. own cabinet member uh, out of, you know, historic uh, curiosity. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if we were to to talk about the sure. the Taiwan uh, mm-hmm. top level domain, sure. uh, is there an effort around archiving mm-hmm. like the whole .tw domain? Mm-hmm. And does that fall under the purview of one of those three? No, uh, no, not not at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Is that an area of mm-hmm. of possible interest? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, who who's the right person to uh, to direct inquiries to? Uh, if you're talking about if you want a domain list of all the uh, registrants of the .tw domain, then TWNIC uh, is the the organization to talk to. Um, it's at arm's length uh, to the National uh, Communication uh, Council, uh, but uh, I think TWNIC is perfectly capable of deciding in multi-stakeholder fashion the international collaborations that is yours. Okay, that that is fantastic. Um, I think that's going to go uh, a long way t- uh, toward answering some of Peggy's questions. So sure, I really appreciate. Sure, it. sure, sure. And if you do make something work, you can share it in TWIGF, the, the Internet Governance Forum. I mean, we have the same Internet Governance Forum system as uh, pretty much everywhere. Fantastic. So I, I would love to, to segue just a little bit beyond web and storage to, to talk about books as sure, well. Sure, sure, sure. So one of the things that I heard, I could be uh, recalling incorrectly, mm-hmm. uh, is that there's been a, a parallel effort in Taiwan mm-hmm. to uh, basically preserve one copy of every important Taiwanese mm, in the national library in the national library mm-hmm. um, and I was wondering to to what extent that content has been digitized mm-hmm. uh, or whether there is an interest in either digitizing it or freely storing it yeah the National Library do provide a digital archive uh, for uh, like um, I'm trying to think of a new short term, uh, a, a um, media and popular demand uh, mm. sometimes uh, makes the digital archive uh, far more visible uh, than its original design. For example, mm-hmm. the PhD thesis of Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, <laughs> I received a lot of views uh, from the uh, National Library. Uh, the physical copy, you probably have to apply to see it, but digital copy has been downloaded, I don't know, many, many times, I guess. So so this also uh, is why we think it's public infrastructure, because mm-hmm. this uh, makes uh, evidence-based communication and public deliberation much more likely and much more possible, as opposed to everybody having to walk in uh, to get a physical scan or physical copy. Well, that's fantastic. Um, in, right. the, in the past, the, the Internet Archive has has worked with volunteers to try to increase the the volume of material yeah. that we've we've digitized. Mm-hmm. Um, something that's also kind of neat is if a a book like object is uploaded to the Internet Archive, mm-hmm. it will automatically do OCR, mm-hmm. uh, make it searchable. Um, so mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll have to get in touch with the the National Libraries as well to um, to determine what types of offerings they're able to uh, to make available mm-hmm. uh, accessibility wise that's right um, yes. because if there is a way for us mm-hmm. to participate um i think our only goal is increase access to knowledge sure. mm-hmm. um, and if there's a way that that we can do that by doing search inside or helping mm-hmm. uh, direct taiwanese patrons um to to the exact material within mm-hmm. a, a book yep. then that'd make me feel great yeah of course uh, and there's also a uh, office uh, reporting directly to the uh, president is called Academia Historica, um, 
which I guess is less well known than Academia Sinica, which is the National Academy. Uh, so I guess Academia Historica, being the historical academy, is also an academy. But anyway, uh, the, the point is that um, the current uh, ch uh, chief, of the chief director of the National Palace Museum uh, used to be uh, chief of the Academia Historica. Uh, and I think um, they did a lot of digitization work of the national history uh, there as well. So uh, that will be another uh, your natural ally to talk to. Okay, fantastic. That gives me at least three places to start uh -huh. yeah. with tw.nic as well. That's right. Um, I have one question around archiving that's going to kind of take me into the second round of questions that I have. So I'm curious how you see the the role of libraries going into the future in Taiwan. Uh, this is something that, that I think the United States has been struggling with, mm -hmm. uh, especially as more materials go digital. Mm -hmm. um, is there a certain future that, that you see or a certain strategy for empowering libraries to, to survive um, beyond DRM uh, material? Well, personally speaking, I think libraries and bookstores are going to be places of co-creation. Uh, we already uh, have like lendable tablets, which is stretching the idea of a library, uh, but at the public libraries, um, so that people can use them as digital opportunity centers, which especially at rural places uh, makes a lot of difference because we do have broadband as human right at just 16 US dollar for unlimited broadband 4G connection is affordable everywhere, uh, regardless of uh, economic or social uh, condition. Uh, but uh, the fact is that one needs someone to handhold um, a, a child I would say, uh, into the digital world uh, so that they can learn uh, applicable skills and connect to larger communities uh, instead of thinking the internet is just a particular anti-social social media website, right? So, so that is uh, what uh, I see the libraries are for people uh, who co-create there to make, say, uh, OpenStreetMap, uh, to mm -hmm. do um, Wikimedia co-creations, uh, to uh, curate, for example, uh, air quality, contribute to air Mm -hmm. climate science and yeah. things like that, which all uh, requires a public gathering of people and libraries like uh, town halls, public parks and things like that are the natural places uh, for such activities to, to happen. Um, I had a long uh, discussion around this topic with the uh, head, the, the chair, uh, CEO of the Eslite, uh, which is a, a prominent bookstore chain mm -hmm. here in Taiwan. Um, and uh, I said that it's time that we think of Shu Dian, uh, the bookstore, uh, into uh, the book as a verb. So Shu also is has a verb meaning of writing, right? So a writing store uh, where you, you go in and co-write and co-create stuff. Hmm. Is there a, a future for there to exist a public repository of, of knowledge that's accessible to, to the public? Because mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I worry about is uh, more and more, uh, especially in, in the United States and perhaps in the UK as well, uh, publishers are switching from a model where once upon a time a library would purchase a book and have the right to uh, survive that book into the future and eventually enter maybe the public domain. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the US now has a public domain that's actually growing. Right. Uh, a very new thing. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very nice. Um, and that was a problem for a while. Yeah, I know. But, but something I'm very concerned mm -hmm. about uh, for for the world, because mm -hmm. I mean, the public domain I think also affects more than just the United States mm -hmm. in terms of accessibility. Mm -hmm. Is as these uh, content providers switch from a model of selling a book to instead having what I see as being a bit more like a subscription model to a DRM piece of content, mm -hmm. then libraries have to pay mm -hmm. over and over again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in order for that material to stay accessible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you stop putting quarters. Mm -hmm. into the coin machine. operated coin operated <laughs> yeah. yeah then the book disappears uh, coin operated book yeah uh -huh. um, so I'm, I'm wondering beyond the the uh, the very noble goal of being almost like a hacker space mm -hmm. a library as this place this beautiful flourishing mm -hmm. place of co-creation um, is there a a, str a strategy uh, for uh, Taiwan to ensure that materials can still be mm -hmm. uh, purchased by libraries? Or... I think we have a larger uh, fair use uh, scope 
uh, mm. than um, most um, other signatories of WIPO, maybe because we negotiated really hard for that when we eventually joined WIPO. In, in my childhood, we're not part of WIPO. So <laughs> anyway, so uh, I think uh, using the fair use doctrine, uh, that's what enabled us to, for example, I personally participate in the Moedic project, uh, and which is actually uh, in honor uh, of Aaron Schwartz, we started uh, that. Um, so um, around the same time uh, that other people are doing other creative things uh, in honor to Aaron Schwartz. But anyway, so what we did is to take a 160,000 entry uh, dictionary, which is widely used, but it's all rights uh, reserved, uh, and just in a very granular, real access kind of way, um, scraped um, everything and turned those uh, old pictures, uh, ideographs into um, crowd OCR Unicode mm. uh, character okay. points and did a JSON um, like restructuring of things and rolled out a mobile version of that using the mobile web so that everything, every single dictionary definition can be shared as a social object uh, and also brought in the Taiwanese Taiyi and Holo, Hakka, uh, many other languages including indigenous Amis uh, as well into a multilingual project. At no time uh, did we think that uh, we're uh, going to be put into prison <laughs> because we understand that the fair use doctrine says that as long as we're just doing format conversion um, mm -hmm. instead of uh, trying to sell it for ourselves which is why we all use CC0, uh, mm -hmm. then the Ministry of Ed Education didn't really have a case against us. And eventually they would switch to a Creative Commons model uh, for that all rights reser uh, copyrights reserved work. But even with all copyrights reserved, uh, this kind of form of conversion, especially for accessibility reasons, are uh, consistently ruled as fair use. Uh, in Taiwan. So uh, I, I worry less about the legal part. Uh, my uh, main uh, idea is just to find the, the kind of social cost, the meme, uh, that will uh, get people into the mood of helping digitizing that or finding a uh, JSON format or whatever for that. Uh, well, I'd like to put a pin in that point because uh -huh. that's that's a, an area where, where um, I've had a bit of, of, of learning and I'm, I'm happy to share that as well. Yes. Um, I also want to, to, to thank Taiwan and yourself for, for pushing so many human mm. policies. Sure. Um, uh, it's really great to hear that, that Taiwan does have this mm. uh, foundation in, in place to, to protect mm -hmm. uh, fair use. Uh, so I, I was going to jump to kind of my, my second set, which is uh, a little bit of, 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 of a few personal questions sure, and also sure. about uh, PDIS. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of a, an interesting segue is around, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I mentioned putting a pin in, in kind of the participation yes, stuff. I remember so, the pin. Yes. So I'll, uh, mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll put that as the, the final thing. So okay. kind of the segue between archiving and yeah. PIS is, uh, I heard from uh, Carrick actually is, is one of my friends who spoke oh, to, okay. to uh, oh. uh, before this. And <laughs> okay. Carrick was Today's mentioning- our good current day. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Karen was mentioning that, uh, and, and Peggy as well, uh -huh. uh, that one one area of, of mm -hmm. uh, uh, focus has been on fighting misinformation, yes. and also on specifically around on COVID and, and mm -hmm. other uh, yeah. uh, health issues. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was wondering if you might be able to to, to teach me a little bit more about. Um, uh, what PDIS and also Taiwan mm -hmm. are doing to fight sure. misinformation, and see if mm -hmm. there there might be an opportunity to link back to any of the infrastructure that the archive has put in place to support those efforts. Sure. So uh, what we're based on is the idea that we never do administrative takedown. Uh, so just like we countered the pandemic this time around with no lockdown, um, not because it doesn't work, it probably does work, but it has negative social externality that will uh, decimate, like literally cut by 10% of the uh, social sector's uh, activities. Because once you do a takedown or lockdown, um, the discourse gets even more polarized. You can see that in the US actually. Yeah. yeah. So uh, our strategy then uh, is uh, taking a uh, epidemiologically informed approach to treat misinformation or disinformation as virus of the mind, uh, understanding that at any given point, the mental bandwidth of the nation maybe only have room for like three trending disinformation at once, 
because they are competitive uh, in their own. So it's about the early detection, right? Advanced warnings, which virus uh, variants have a higher than one R value, uh, where uh, each individual receiving it will on average share to more than one person. So we got to have that uh, insight, that dashboard. Um, and so uh, the COFAX projects from the GovZero uh, is one of the more serious uh, projects tackling that. Uh, and they want broad support uh, from the leading end-to-end uh, -end encrypted messaging application, the LINE uh, platform. So LINE partnered them uh, with the LINE corporate social responsibility team in Taiwan so that for every uh, message you receive in end-to-end -end encrypted channels, you can long press it and report it as a spam, essentially flag as spam. And people understand and that. It's just like email, right? If you decide to flag something as spam, you're, you're basically saying, uh, I want to dedicate the fingerprint of this email so that in the future, the same sender, when they want to send unsolicited uh, email to other people, it lands on their junk mail box rather than their, their inbox, right? So um, we have a dashboard, uh, uh, the line uh, disinformation uh, dashboard, uh, where you can see what's the trending uh, virus of the mind that's going on. And couple that, with a, uh, a fact-checking community, the international fact-checking community, the IFCN, which has at least two Taiwan uh, members, the Taiwan Fact Check Center and MyGoPen, M-Y-G-O-P-E-N, are the two members. So for the trending disinformation, they will do journalistic work, uh, fact-checking, uh, hopefully in real time. And once they do it, they publish it. Now, uh, the challenge is how to get it back, right, to the original people spreading this misinformation. And so we use a strategy called uh, notice and public notice uh, where for example um around the election time, um, November 2019, there was a popular uh, rumor going uh, in, in Taiwan that says uh, Hong Kong protesters are being paid uh, 200K or something to kill police, unquote, um, and, and which is, of course, disinformation. Uh, but the Taiwan Fact Check Center traced it to a Reuters photo. It's a real photo, but the caption has been altered. Uh, the photo originally only said that there are teenager protesters. And that's because it's the deciding issue for the Taiwanese presidential election. Mm -hmm. So um, TFCC traced it to the Weibo account of the Central Political and Law Unit of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and it's on their Weibo account, so it's very overt, it's not covert. Uh, and then with notice and public notice, people who see it on, say, Facebook, uh, mm -hmm. they can still see it, they can still share it, but with a, a caveat that says, yeah. you know, according to TFCC, this is sponsored, state-sponsored propaganda, uh, which is not what Reuters originally uh, reported. Uh, so it increased the uh, competence of people, not just literacy, competence, because they can then create new narratives based on these annotated data. And we also roll out our own clarifications from the ministries uh, with professional comedians, uh, with the popular sp spoke stock uh, for the uh, epidemic related uh, clarifications. Sometimes the Shiba Inu, uh, uh, the spoke stock, uh, just uh, talking away that's very much fun. Uh, and when people feel the joy, the fun, the humor, the tension that's uh, raised by outrage just gets channeled into co-creation is along the street. It doesn't go back. If you have felt joy about creating something, it's very difficult to go back into uh, retaliation or discrimination, right? So um, once we create those memes, we also spread those memes. And once those memes have higher than one R value, then it serves like herd immunity or nerd immunity, I guess. <laughs> so that people would no longer spread uh, this information. So it's a ecosystem. The leading uh, uh, antivirus company, Trend Micro, has a bot uh, dedicated for that called Fang Jia Da Ren, the, I guess, disinformation buster. Um, another startup called uh, Who's Call also has uh, the main, another line based spot uh, that does the early de detection as well as notice and public notice, but none of them do any sort of takedown, especially not administrative takedown. Okay, this is this is great. So I'm, I'm hearing there's uh, this heterogeneous ensemble of, of approaches. One of them, which is almost as a, a first class citizen, the line app lets you hold, impress, and mark something as spam at right. the end of an end to end encrypted channel. The, the other thing is that there's a dashboard which helps mm -hmm. humans um, uh, mitigate yeah, the Yeah, to the gain process. visibility into the trending. Right? Into, the, into the trending. Uh -huh. And then finally, more along the lines of mainstream media, uh -huh. um, this I think was like notice and public notice is an right. effort to attach 
annotations mm -hmm. and caveats yeah. to, to and, and those professional fact checkers they're not state sponsored in any way so they also fact check us and keep us honest uh, and where do the where do the fact checkers generally come from is it the mm -hmm. same is a, a specific pool of people well usually people train in journalism i mean all the larger journalistic uh, institutions already do source and fact check them by themselves That's what you're saying. right but uh, they uh, didn't uh, do it in a kind of public way uh, with partnership with so many people before uh, but now uh, people are seeing that this is essential, right? This is essential public infrastructure because not many people uh, have this uh, uh, instant reaction to go check your local news mm -hmm. <laughs> when, when they see something that's making their rounds. Yeah. So they have to do the public notice uh, in the ground of where the disinformation brews, which is the more anti-social corner of social media. And along that question, uh, do you feel that the source material mm -hmm. Uh, is often available when it's needed. Mm -hmm. So in this, in, in one of the cases you mentioned, there was yeah. the, the router's uh, uh, image. Sure. And uh, presumably a fact checker could mm -hmm. go back in time and notice that there was an alteration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, the, so they used a the Wayback Machine, of course. Okay. Yeah. Um, interesting. So that, that mm -hmm. might be one specific avenue if the World Wide Web is a big place. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, if we were to talk to our friends at TW Nick and, and see if we could get a more targeted list of things mm -hmm. that might even be COVID related mm -hmm. and make sure that those are backed up. Mm -hmm. That could be a big win for, for mm -hmm. source material. So maybe that's something I'll look into as well. Thanks, sure. for, mm -hmm. thanks for bringing that up. Okay, so the, the next question that I have is just learning a little bit more about uh, PDIS and, and how it, it bloomed into the, the wonderful thing it is today. Now, I'm curious if there was a either another concept or organization that, that really sparked your your imagination that, that uh, fueled some of the, the direction. Oh, it's GUP0, right? Uh, well, what Pete has is, is done is essentially taking the GUP0 working model, mm -hmm. uh, rough consensus running code uh, and things like that within the cabinet. So we call ourselves the public digital innovation space because this is really a space for co-creation. This is not a, a office where I give orders or anything like that, right? So GIMP0 is our direct um, inspiration, but GIMP0 uh, itself uh, takes uh, lessons from many other communities. The GIMP0 hackathons are loosely modeled uh, after the open space technology as practiced in the uh, food camps and bar camps uh, and, um, you know, uh, work that both Jalian Gao and I worked uh, with Social Text, uh, which is where the, um, the bar camp stuff uh, started. Uh, and uh, this whole nonviolent communication tradition, uh, facilitated discussion and deliberation, a lot of things that we do is just uh, providing a digital counterpart of what has already worked uh, in the community building work, uh, in the nonviolent communication work um, that the Taiwanese people are already quite familiar with. Uh, and by finding the digital counterpart, without uh, replacing or substituting uh, the analog uh, parts. We amplify the lessons learned in the analog places. So that, that leads me to, to kind of two questions. Sure. And I'm happy to let you navigate however you'd like. Sure. But the, the two questions I have is along the lines of taking uh, what's already working mm -hmm. and making it digital, uh, there, there's kind of the, the joint platform of, of voting is, is this mm -hmm. one major effort to involve more people That's around right. the island mm -hmm. in, in uh, participating and having a voice. Um, so that's, that's one avenue I'm, I'm interested mm -hmm. in exploring. The other is uh, even walking around the, the beautiful mm -hmm. courtyard here yeah. at PDIS mm -hmm. and looking at the different signs, mm -hmm. I think I may have counted 16. Mm -hmm. um, everything from sustainability oh, yeah. to poverty. Yes. Um, and, and so on one hand, I can imagine there being consensus from the, the community, the community kind of in a, a duocracy type way decides where the fire hose gets pointed. But, but I'm also curious, uh, from, from your own perspective, uh, given that there is so much exposure and coverage, so many different important things that need to be tackled, mm -hmm. uh, among those 16 axioms, mm -hmm. where, 
where do you uh, or how do you find the balance and mm -hmm. and focus to really uh, make the the mm -hmm. impact that you're you're imagining or that others yeah imagine? of the 17 global goals uh, 17, the sorry. the no the the 16 are concrete ones right uh, what from the very basic needs uh, ending poverty ending hunger health care and so on uh, to the more structural more planetary uh, like uh, you know uh, the climate action, uh, life underwater and on the land, uh, and uh, open government, that's the 16th. Um, mm -hmm. my, my main work is on the 17th, uh, which is the most abstract. It's called uh, Partnership for the Goals. And what 17 does on the very concrete terms is uh, reliable data, making sure that people focusing on each problem share mutually agreeable data so that there's mutual accountability and we can understand the repercussions and externalities that each work uh, places on the other work. So reliable data. And then uh, effective partnership, meaning that if we see um, that there are partners already doing things better than we would do ourselves, uh, then we should actually work work together and, and uh, collaborate, even though maybe um, you are a for-profit with purpose organization and they are a uh, for-purpose with profit <laughs> organization, uh, there are still uh, interesting cases of cross-sectoral partnership uh, that should be done and fostered. So that's 17, uh, 17 I believe. Uh, and then uh, also uh, open innovation, which is really critical because um, in many cases, if we design the market such that there is more incentive in revealing what you have learned uh, rather than keeping it to yourself uh, under intellectual property or whatever other um, ideas, then uh, it brings uh, appropriate technology to the appropriate people mm -hmm. where they can appropriate it uh, and remix it um, and solve any local problem. Because not to do that would be uh, authoritarian intelligence, uh, not assistive intelligence, uh, which to me AI uh, falls on this broad spectrum of whether it empowers more people or empowers only the few, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, another of the 17th goal. So um, to recap, uh, reliable data, effective partnership, and open innovation. Uh, these are the main things that I work on and not specifically on any of the 16, because I do believe that in many of the structural issues, the economic, the environmental, and the social issues are broadly convergent if people are given a public space to discover the common values despite initial different positions. So uh, this brings up a question that I don't know that I, I had originally. Mm -hmm. um, but when I hear reliable data, effective partnership, open innovation, I think uh, just as much about the data as I do the platform. And something that I, I recall hearing is that um, a lot of times it's hard to use existing platforms mm -hmm. because they may not embody um, all of PDIS's beliefs in, right. in openness. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, every time we build new technology, mm -hmm. it becomes susceptible to some sort of exploitation. And so mm -hmm. a good example in the United States, uh, one of the, the saddest memories and uh, or events in recent memory is when the, the open internet order in the United States became rolled back and the FCC had asked for uh, comments from the public and there was a large outpouring of, of comments and, and spam. Um, and as a result, the, the FCC discounted uh, the community's voice. And so I'm, I'm curious, in uh, in partnership with number 17. Yeah, if we try something like that in Taiwan, we'll probably face a referendum. Huh. Well, well I'm curious, even with uh, with joint platform uh -huh. voting, uh -huh. um, how, uh, how does one have confidence that, uh -huh. that systems like this accurately give uh -huh. people a voice and um, and don't suffer from uh -huh. some of the uh, negative scaling aspects uh -huh. of, of digital. Well, first of all, there's always an outside game, right? If yeah. there's no good digital public infrastructure, well, we occupy the parliament, yeah. right? So, so people who uh, are fed up with the non-transparent uh, trade deal uh, with Beijing back in 2014, literally occupied the problem and did MPs work uh, that the MPs were refusing to do. Uh, and, and that sent a very strong signal in that if the career public service doesn't work with the people, then they don't get to work for the people. <laughs> so, so, so that's, I think, uh, uh, the, there's a kind of ultimatum implied in any of those online public participation designs mm -hmm. in that if we do it the uh, half-hearted way, 
then people will initiate a referendum uh, and to to essentially take the agenda setting power back. And even if that even that didn't work, then people will probably take to the streets or occupy the parliament. It's always this um, often unsaid but always implied outside game uh, that keeps uh, the the whole thing in check. That makes sense to me. I also want to be cognizant of, of uh, time here. Maybe. Sure, sure. Three, okay. Yeah. Uh, so my my last line of I have I have other questions maybe a, a around um, uh, your personal feelings of what success would look mm -hmm. like in mm -hmm. maybe ten years from now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, if number seventeen mm -hmm. uh, is fully realized is well maybe maybe we mm -hmm. maybe we we hope that it will never be realized mm -hmm. because there's always good work to sure, be done but but if we if we're on the right trajectory mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so so Aaron has has this little essay. Uh, which is kind of like the continuance of, yeah. of like, uh, for me, I adapted it to if I ever get hit by the self-driving car, mm -hmm. then then what happens to the program and what's mm -hmm. the direction? And so, or I'm, get I'm, hit by the human driving car. Or that's <laughs> maybe the scary. <laughs> that's the scary when you're right. Um, so the, the human driving car. Uh, what do you what do you hope to be true? Mm -hmm. um, in, in order to say, like, you really feel like the, mm -hmm. the, the program and Taiwan are, mm -hmm. are in a, a healthy digital direction. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm uh, happy about it now. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So um, I think a lot of things that we proved uh, in Taiwan uh, for fighting not just the infodemic and the pandemic, uh, but for the more structural issue, for example, how to resolve the marriage equality mm -hmm. um, equation uh, for people in different generations who have very different definition of family and marriage and things like that, uh, show that um, this uh, kind of radically um, um, mutually accountable uh, way of policy making really does find the innovations that take care of all those different positions feelings without 49% of people feeling they have lost. Um, and so, uh, for example, the marriage equality thing, um, it's done by one constitutional ruling, two referendum that define the solution space very clearly so that uh, when two same-sex uh, people wed, uh, they wed uh, uh, enjoying all the same uh, bylaws uh, relationships, uh, that is to say the duties and the rights and so on as uh, heterosexual couples, but the family, the like brother-in-law, mother-in-law, um, the in-law relationships do not form. So their families don't wed according to our civil code. And, and this is a very interesting um, like redefinition of marriage that's eclectic that takes care of different generations' marriage expectations and that, frankly speaking, works better than uh, 51% of people winning anything, right? Um, and, and so the continued uh, democratic trajectory of Taiwan uh, has led us to now the National Action Plan of Open Government on the cabinet side, which was just published. Um, and very soon, I think next week, the parliament is going to publish their own National Action Plan, uh, Open Parliament, uh, with all the four major parties signing on it. So they disagree on, I don't know, 99% of other policy issues, but the uh, four major parties all agree on uh, furthering of the democracy and connecting internationally on the value of democracy. And, and to me, I mean, that means that I've already designed myself out. Right. This this is um, no matter which political party uh, wins the presidential election or legislative election, they can only turn this forward. They can't roll it back anymore. Mm. I love that. Um, so I think it, it's it especially speaks. Uh, it's a testament to to human rights, to mm -hmm, equality, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to um, establishing these these empowering elements that that allow everyone to be equal um, on on a human level. But I'm curious, and this also brings me into participation within PDIS, mm -hmm. within the government, mm -hmm. within um, uh, the, the the Taiwan program. Sure, as well. sure. Uh, I'm curious, how does this extend um, beyond human rights mm -hmm. into uh, labor, labor mm -hmm. equality? Uh, one of the things that I, I feel like has been um, Surprising to me is is how many talented people there are mm -hmm. um, in Taiwan, um, and uh, either and I could be wrong, so I don't I don't have as much experience here. But either people who are really talented mm -hmm. um, end up relocating to a different area because of opportunity, 
it seems like the, the gold card may be one way to try to attract. Yeah, we, we uh, call it talent circulation. Talent right? circulation. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I think that's, that's great. Uh -huh. um, um, but I guess my question applies as much uh -huh. to, to brain drain or, or talent uh -huh. circulation um, in Taiwan, but uh -huh. also to the gold card itself, which is how, um, how does one shift the dynamics of Taiwanese labor and employment to to make it so that uh, more people do want to become and can become whether it's a software engineer mm -hmm. or I, I don't want to pretend that tech is the the only mm -hmm. the only option but one of these i'll call it highly leveraged maybe mm -hmm. opportunities um where they want to do it in taiwan and they also uh, see a way to connect that with their participation mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. government Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, a couple of things. The, the first I would like to point out is that our work in the government is just to introduce this whole co-creation, design thinking, um, this idea of agile um, development uh, tempo, so that instead of every quarter we work in weekly or bi-weekly iterations, even our own team works in such weekly iterations. And once the career public service are um, enjoying uh, this new tempo, understanding this actually garners more trust, uh, reduce risk, save their time, very important, um, then uh, they're much more willing to reach out. So case in point, um, a bunch of gold card holders uh, started TaiwanGoldCard.com uh, in an open source way on GitHub. Uh, and because they're probably fed up with the uh, National Development Council's uh, original gold card website or digital service, which is very unusable. Uh, but then uh, the NDC invited those bunch of people in, and then they co-created the new portal, GoldCard nat.gov.tw mm -hmm. um, and so forking uh, with the intention to merge I think that is mm -hmm. how we how we introduce mm -hmm. um, there's a mathematic structure for it. it's called conflict free replicable data type right CRDTs um, if we structure our policies our policy making process as a series of CRDTs uh, then uh, any part of it may be forked with the intention of merging back not forked uh, just mm -hmm. to criticize or things like that but with actively um, a uh, ethos of remaining in the uh, open access and uh, per open definition open data and open source uh, traditions so that the government when it wants to merge it back uh, faces minimal friction they don't have to do coin operated uh, software as a service, uh, sorry, service as a software substitute uh, or SaaS model. Uh, they can just uh, merge whatever on the GitHub back, which is precisely what happened in many of the government digital services here. So uh, this is the government side. That's the second part of your question. Yeah. The first part of your question, I think it pertains to Taiwan's original culture of uh, most of the software people I know working in a uh, Moore's Law cycle of 18 months because they work very closely with the semiconductor and hardware yep. uh, supply chain. Uh, and when software works in that time cycle, uh, of course, it's very precise, it works very well, and which fosters, I guess, Taiwan's software industry is almost all uh, to business. Um, that is to say, uh, there's a peer, but the Pizza Huts of the world probably wouldn't say powered by a peer uh, on their websites, right? There's Trend Micro, but uh, um, you know, a large enterprise pro probably wouldn't say secure by Trend Micro on their websites and so on. So that leads to less visibility of mm -hmm. software people, even though there is a software industry. Um, the the uh, people facing part of the software is less visible. Uh, and I think it could be fixed quite easily by people working on uh, customer facing uh, like the Dolphin browser or whatever uh, and, and just proudly saying that they're working toward international audience. Maybe they are international people to begin with. Yeah, maybe Taiwan is just one uh, very small bit of their total marketplace or maybe it's not a marketplace at all. Uh, but they are happy to be in Taiwan physically and work with the Taiwanese community to share what they have learned um, as software uh, creators and so on. So what I'm trying to say is that a social sector of uh, software practitioners uh, like Gov Zero, like VTAMA, which literally means every week here, um, is uh, I think the, the best way for people who do not otherwise have supply chain relationship with one another, but they can share like uh, the Radio Exchange Foundation, which I'm also a board member of, just literally takes whatever people learn from Ethereum, like quadratic voting and whatever, share in the local meetup, and lo and behold, it become presidential hackathon. Uh, right? So the governance uh, model of our 
democracy can be upgraded with whatever we learn from internet governance, blockchain governance, or other experiments in governance. So that's purely social sector, like norm defining uh, ecosystem. That makes a lot of sense. So I think we've jumped from archiving to PDIS, and then also to, to participation. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my final question is, uh, I, I love, by the way, the, the analogy of using CRDTs of like maybe 80% don't make it merged in, but there's there's some confidence that the 20% that do in that power law That's are going right. to be the things that really move the needle um, yes. and the most people are frustrated mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for sharing yeah, that. Power law to the people. Yeah. Yeah. Power law to the people, yeah. And working towards the idea of merging is, mm -hmm. is also beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so if people do want to participate, sure. uh, if, if there's one thing that I can achieve mm -hmm. by being with you in, in front of the camera, sure. Um, the, the thing that I hear really frequently mm -hmm. from people in these, whether it's gold card mm -hmm. chats or, or things of that nature, is I wish there was a way for me to plug in with my software engineering uh, oh, sure. capabilities. Just fork the government. Yes. <laughs> so uh, in, in particular, um, is is uh, gov.tw mm -hmm. the, the right place to get started? Gov0, yes. Oh, oh, G Gov0. G -G so um, the national participation platform is join the gov.tw. If you change your O to a zero, you get into the shadow government, join the g0v.tw, uh, which is a Slack channel. I think 8,000 people on it. Yeah. Got it. So uh, if they wanted to join the Slack channel, they mm -hmm. can go to the website. Yeah, and invite yourself in. Okay. And there's uh, like bi-monthly hackathons, many smaller meetups and things like that. Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be remiss to ask, is there, there anything else I can be, be helpful or, or mm -hmm. useful with based on any of the questions that we, I've asked? You can share the fact that as of last Christmas, the Ministry of Science and Technology relaxed the gold card criteria uh, mm -hmm. so that anyone with the potential to contribute to science or technology in Taiwan is now eligible. Oh. Uh, so it's pretty much everybody. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I would like to also, if you yeah. let me, thank thank you on behalf of my friend Peggy. Sure. I'm, I'm sure is ecstatic that, that you were so mm -hmm. kind to, to answer sure. the questions. So uh, you want to go back to the thing you pinned or it's already resolved? Uh, I think we, we resolved it because mm -hmm. really we were pinning the, the participation yeah, that's and, right. and what are the ways to, mm -hmm. to get involved. So. Ah, okay, so yeah, through Gov0, I think it's actually faster than uh, if you, uh, I don't know, work for the government as a contractor or something. Yeah. Because even many government employees or contractors also doubles as Gov0 con contributors. Because if they can prove that something works uh, for the large fraction of the community or of the population, um, then the ministries are already very well versed in merging in those outside uh, contributions. Yeah. So uh, just like in uh, free software, uh, like forks speak louder than words, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and just fork whatever that you don't like about our government mm -hmm. digital service or uh, really like the go kart experience, which mm -hmm. essentially got forked and merged back. Yeah. So that that does raise one one question that yes. I hadn't hadn't thought of, uh -huh. which is. Um, so having having time to participate mm -hmm. and contribute is within itself, I think, a privilege. Sure, um, of course. And uh, I wonder, I wonder if uh, some of these these programs are more accessible to people who may have may have you know time mm -hmm. or their own source of funding. Yeah, well, yes. Uh, so f first of all, we're aware of that, which is why we made say the public participation on a joint platform uh, part of the civics class. Right? Mm -hmm. So we have more than one quarter of citizen initiatives by people who are not even 18 years old. And they did mm -hmm. so because it's their civics class assignment, because it's their capstone project. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of by definition, they have time. It's the byproduct of them learning uh, how to be a citizen. Right. And that also applied to community colleges, lifelong learning centers, uh, the USR, universities, social responsibility programs, and so on and so forth uh, in all different age groups. So combining it with education, making it so that they are um, producers, not just consumers of uh, data and digital media uh, competence instead of literacy. Uh, I think that's how we get people uh, to build a habit of participating when they notice something wrong. Um, and so also also for the funding part, uh, GovZero has its grants, so GovZero grants. Uh, there are many uh, social impact related grants also in Taiwan. Um, so um, many of them are on our social innovation platform, si.taiwan.gov.tw. We also have the presidential hackathon, which for this year probably starts around April, um, where the hackathon prize is not money, but a presidential promise that whatever you build will be funded by the state as, as national infrastructure. Yeah, so that's also something to look into.
That's fantastic. So someone can go to si.taiwan.gov.tw right. and uh, discover it's, different yeah, funding. Yeah, it's bilingual. And, and if you think there are parts that's not translated and not translated well, just write an email. Brilliant. Uh -huh. Avi, thank you so much thank you. for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. And thanks, everyone.